Welcome to another show of Celebrate Life. My name is Gary DeCarlis, and I'm your host. Uh, the ins- for new uh, viewers, the inspiration for this show was a combination of uh, uh, having written my memoir over the past year for my daughters and being a uh, avid reader of obituaries over the years and always leaving them with a sense of, gosh, I wish I had a chance to meet this person while they were alive. Um, so I thought, why don't we have a television show that actually allows you to meet people while they're very much vibrant and alive and thus uh, celebrate life was born. Uh, if you're interested in becoming uh, a person that I interview, uh, please let me know. You can write me at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com. Or if you know someone that might be interested, you can also send me a note. Also, if you have a question for the people that I interview, send me an email at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com, and I'll get that question over to the uh, person I'm interviewing and get a response back to you. Listen, bottom line on all this is that everyone has a story to tell. Um, What I have found that people have very rich lives and um, giving you an opportunity to hear from them, learn from them um, is an honor for me to do. So today I'd like to introduce you to someone that I know very well. He's actually a close friend but also a tremendous um, professional in his work. He's a community development specialist. He's written about it. He's lectured about it. He's organized meetings about it. And uh, he's, he's, uh, in my mind, he's the Tom Brady of community and economic development. He's uh, a special guy. I'd like you to welcome Bruce Seifer. Hi, Bruce. Hi, Gary. Great to see you. Great to see you, too. Great to have an opportunity to talk with you today. So Bruce, you, you have had an amazing career uh, and we've had a chance to work together back in the 1980s, but through a number of um, administrations in the city of Burlington, Vermont, who have done absolutely amazing things of bringing the business community and government together and making magic and helping fund projects that have given jobs to people, good paying jobs to people have revitalized neighborhoods that were not doing well, and have really made, helped make Burlington a very vibrant, active city. So tell me a little bit, how did you get into this work, and, and what drives you to be who you are in, in your work? Thank you, Gary. I, I started my career, well, I studied accounting in college uh, because it was, I was uh, a relative had suggested to me that if I want to be successful and own my own company, I need to know finance and accounting. And that's how we got into the nursing home business. He started as an accountant and then opened his own nursing homes. And so I studied accounting at Ohio State University. And when I finished college, my father, who was an altruist and an honorable man, urged me to do two years of community service before I started working and getting into the business world. Hmm. So I, uh, after a year of traveling after college, I traveled all throughout North America looking for a place to live that I would want to settle for the rest of my life. I chose Burlington as did many other people that I met traveling on the road for that year. Uh, And I started looking for jobs in nonprofits Instead of when I researched companies, all the businesses that were in Burlington, who this, who the people who ran the companies, what they did, and I created business cards for every company in the Chittenden County area, and you know how much sales they had. I, I did a lot of digging to figure out who was there so I can get engaged in the community. Mm-hmm. And I think something called Thomas's Register that I looked through for extensively mm-hmm. in the library. And then I got a job at Champlain Valley working training programs as a data analyst. And I stayed doing that for two years and they were an employment and training organization that grew from a small organization to having 17 offices throughout the state of Vermont Hmm. and 7,000 people in our programs 
it was when the unemployment rate was getting high and the cities were burning across the country and the country was figured they should put people to work. And so then I switched positions to be the, uh, an auditor because we were giving out hundreds of contracts to private sector and public sector. I had five people working for me. And we audited, I audited personally, 70 towns throughout the state of Vermont. And yeah. I, I learned to love working in the nonprofit world. And I did, I used to research effective workforce training programs. I'd read all these monitors that came out from the Department of Labor. And I was trying to figure out the best innovative programs in the country that we could replicate because we had literally 150 staff, 7,000 people working throughout the state of Vermont. And I wanted to make sure that people had a good career opportunity. Um, and then I went to become the fiscal director for the governor's committee in the employment of the handicap in Waterbury. And it was a statewide organization and I continued working in the employment and training. I got laid off and spent two and a half years traveling uh, and came back to Burlington and met uh, a woman that I fell in love with, Julie Davis, and I figured I'd better get a job. <laughs> and I started volunteering at City Hall in the treasurer's office because right. Ernie was mayor. And when I was at the employment and training organization, I would see things that were not right. And I thought things should be different. And I saw politicians who were not operating, but I, from my perspective, effectively and doing a good job. I saw Bernie as somebody who was taking on the system and trying to help the underdog. Mm -hmm. And I had been doing that in my career for six years before that. So I volunteered at the treasurer's office. And the first job I was given uh, was to evaluate a budget for a new organization they wanted to create, which is the Community and Economic Development Office. Mm -hmm. And I saw that there was this job doing economic development that was going to be created. And I said, now that's a good place. That's something I'd like to do. I can work for Bernie and I can help the business community to be successful. And uh, they were going to, Bernie had set aside $200,000 of stimulus money at that time, <laughs> set up a revolving loan fund to help small businesses. And they wanted somebody to create the program and provide technical assistance. During the two and a half years that I wasn't, I stopped working at the, the, at the governor's committee on the employment of the handicap by providing counseling to businesses on accounting, because I, I studied accounting and I knew finance. And so right. I was doing that as some work on the side. Right. And, uh, and then I got hired to set up this loan fund and that opened up an opportunity to uh, provide support to the business community with the principles and values that I, that were kind of imbued within me. Hmm. Oh, yeah. So it wasn't a coincidence since that you went to work for the city of Burlington during a progressive administration. It sounds like it fit your values, it fit your your uh, skills and and uh, and talents. It just kind of was a marriage between both of those things. Yeah, they what they were looking for was somebody who had experience working with the business community and also understood government programs. And my right. responsibilities before was tracking all government resources, knowing the laws inside and out, and making sure that our programs were, were spending the money effectively and met the law, but also understood the business community. And my family, everyone owned companies, my extended family. Mm -hmm. owned, mm -hmm. And I just assumed I would be in uh, I mean, understanding business. My father had a business at his house. Right. And my mother used to do uh, bookkeeping, you know, for companies on the kitchen, on the dining room table. And I, she'd have me help her. So I got to learn that. And then I was good at math growing wow. up. Yep. Uh, so it was a chance to use the skills. At that time, I was 30, 31 years old, uh, and help out in the community and work for an organization that was trying to unlock the capacity within our community. And that, that engaged me as something that met the values that I had 
And I learned growing up from my parents, from going to the temple. Right. And my family. And here is this brand new wing of government called the Community and Economic Development Office. You were right at the ground floor of that. <clears throat> and um, and then, so early on, what was your, some of your uh, successes in your work? Well, first off, uh, I was hired to create this loan fund. So we hired this guy, Alan Abraham, who had just stopped working from the Small Business Administration in Washington. And he set up their two major programs called the 7A program, the 504 or 503 program. And he just had created these programs. And we were one of his first consulting gigs. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that our loan fund mirrored the SBA program so a business could come for us for an application for a loan and also get an SBA loan and a bank loan without filling out three sets of forms. Hmm. We just fill one set of forms. Right. Uh, and so I, we created, you know, spent several months working with the attorney's office uh, and uh, create, making sure we fit all the federal laws, which are extensive, in order to do business lending, because there wasn't that much of it using community development block grant funding at that time. So we had to make sure that we met all of the strict rules, which there are a lot of. Uh, and so we, I ended up doing that. And one of the first projects that the director of the office, Peter Cobell, who hired me, uh, asked me to create a laundromat in the King Street neighborhood. Mm. And so I worked, uh, I turned my attention to the Pine Street area and worked with a fellow named Arnie Sherman who had Gaslight Laundromat on North Street. And uh, we encouraged him, I encouraged him to locate in the King Street neighborhood and he, and he found the old Vermont Main Maple Syrup building on Pine Street on the corner of Marble and Pine that was vacant. And it was derelict to say the least. And he, I worked, we lent him we had a loan criteria of no more than $25,000. Uh, and we would provide basically 25% of the funding. He'd provide at least 10% and the bank would come in for the rest. And uh, I worked with Arnie and the building had, it was complicated in that the city sewer system, we have this combined system and they, they didn't want to have all this water flushing through the sewer system because it couldn't handle it. So there was these vats in the basement that, uh, Arnie hooked up the washing machines into these vats. And so when the, uh, he would trickle off the water in the evening when the system, the sewer system wasn't over capacity. And so at that point, we, we got around our criteria and I lent him another 20,000 on top of 25,000 in order to deal with this building, which was completely right. taken. And that was the start of kind of the revitalization of the Pine Street area. Hmm. which I ended up spending 30 years of my career revitalizing, which was a industrial wasteland at that point. A lot of vacant buildings. The industry had moved out to the suburbs. Right. And it was happening all across the country. Wow. That's amazing. So, that so was you moved... Success. So you moved from that to um, some quite large projects, too. Um, I know you did some work with Main Street Landing. Tell, tell the story of Main Street Landing and, and, this, and your, your work with them. Sure. Well, the city of Burlington uh, wanted to redevelop our waterfront. It had been an industrial wasteland, contaminated, oil tanks everywhere, and uh, it was not a safe place. My father-in-law at the time, Tom Davis, went to college at the University of Vermont in 1951, and he said he would never go to the waterfront. It was too, it was too scary. Hmm. And so uh, it was, you know, the industrial age when in the 1800s, when the waterfront was very active, it was the third largest lumber port in the world. Right. Uh, and there used to be lumber stacked basically from the waterfront all the way down the Pine Street area. And there were processes in it. Uh, and then, you know, the industry, the railroad came and things changed. Uh, and so we worked, the office worked with Main Street Landing Company, Melinda Moulton uh, and Lisa. And 
uh, we spent a lot of time uh, changing this, this, this community and economic development office, their charter, part of their charter was to uh, help manage government grant programs, write government grants, develop affordable housing programs, revitalize neighborhoods, build economic opportunity because the economy was in the tank at the time, and also uh, create a vibrant waterfront, including taking the planning of the waterfront on. And so the office spent a lot of time interacting with the community, presenting ideas, uh, passing resolutions, the city council, bringing several initiatives to the, the, the residents to see if they wanted this type of waterfront. And Main Street Landing owned a lot of the waterfront property. So we had worked with them on several iterations. And um, there were a lot of failed starts, but there was a lot of public process. We had meetings with a thousand people out of 39,000 showing up to public mm -hmm. meetings. Wow. So we got a lot of feedback and eventually we got this federal designation as a renewal community. And which gave the city uh, the ability to uh, stimulate revitalization of underutilized areas. If, and what the, the uh, requirement that we were offered the opportunity to change was offer accelerated depreciation for building properties, revitalizing properties. So instead of writing off the property over 39 years, you can write it off over 10 years, which gave tax advantages to stimulate mm -hmm. investment. Yep. So we can allocate up to 12 million a year. And I called Melinda and I said, look, we can out, we got this federal designation, which took a lot of work to get, and we could allocate $10 million to your project. Why don't you, you know, we had all these failed projects. Why don't you build it and, and apply for this incentive, which she did. And, uh, and I, the problem was that she didn't have any tenants. She, she had, they were going through the process and they were gonna have uh, a pizza place uh, locate in there, which eventually ended up on City Hall Park, flatbread pizza, but they couldn't wait as long because the process was taking so long. And so uh, she said to me, we don't have any tenants. And it was a $17 million project. I said, start construction, we'll get to the, alloc the tax allocation and I'll find you tenants. And so she said, okay. <laughs> and they borrowed $17 million with no tenants, mm -hmm. with tax incentives that we could offer them. And halfway through the process, Melinda called me up, freaked out, saying, I don't have any tenants. And we're spending $17 million on this project. I said, keep going, I'll get you tenants. <laughs> and so thankfully, next week, uh, Jeffrey Hollander, seventh generation, called me up and said, they're looking for new headquarters. And I hooked them up with Main Street Landing. They rented 25,000 square feet and the project cash flowed ever since. Wow. And so it took a public-private partnership. We were the public partner. Main Street Landing was the private partner. And I asked Melinda about this just the other day. I had lunch at her house recently. Mm -hmm. And I asked her, I said, how could you, in your right mind, start construction on this project <laughs> without any tenants she said we trusted you mm. come through mm. um, and we and so that's what it was it was trust yeah. on yeah. all the, the communication and working over time and uh and so i part of that was is getting to know people in the community helping them out mm. and you did that you know they knew that they had a partner within the city Yep. And then grow their companies. Yeah, yeah. So that was in essence what kind of launched that. So she she's right to say you know that she trusted you obviously, but where did you get the confidence to say go ahead and build that and I'll find you somebody? You have a sense of uh, self that um, at some level is a little uncanny for people who are taking risks, but you have been able to come through for them uh, regularly. Where did you get that confidence? I think uh, my parents. Uh, yeah. My parents were 
uh, very smart people. I didn't figure that out till I was 25. I thought they were dumb <laughs> as a child growing up. But my father uh, was an average student in school, public school. He grew up in Toronto, Canada, mm -hmm. with had American parents. And when he, the war, World War II happened, he got drafted and was in the Signal Corps, and he was going to be a radio man. And he found out soon thereafter that the radio men were the first people targeted by the Nazis to kill. Mm. And he didn't want to be killed. So he then realized, then he found out that the top two students in the Navy became teachers in the Navy. Mm. So an average student, by working with his buddy, uh, Shaw, Harry Shaw, and they studied hard and became the top two students in the Navy. And, wow. uh, and he became a teacher at the Signal Corps in Monmouth, New Jersey. My wow. mother was a student of his, and she had grad she first to graduate college from our family. And mm -hmm. she was a mathematics major and a minor in psychology, and she studied under Abraham Maslow. Maslow. Oh, my God. Goodness. And so she was a protege of his, and she respected him. And uh, recently, my brother, my mother, my parents, my father died in 95. My mother died 2005, 2009, excuse me. And we divided out the stuff in the house. My brother's been going through stuff and found out that my mother got accepted to go to Brooklyn College when she was 13 years old. And we oh. looked at each other and said, that can't be. <laughs> and she, he had the, you know, the invitation. She didn't go until she was 16. Jeez. So I found out that I had smart parents. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she was a code breaker during the war, and she was on a team of mathematicians that worked with a fellow who invented the computer during World War II. Uh, and so they focused raising the family uh, as in a, the most important thing that they saw themselves. I have an older brother and an older sister, Mark and Mary, mm -hmm. and uh, they focused their efforts to raising whole people. And, you know, they would, they were, my mother was very clever. You know, she would give, a, give me choices, one A or B, so I had it. I had self worth, but mm -hmm. choice or A or B were either good choices. But she knew to give me those choices so I could gotcha. make decisions on my own. Yes. And so I, I, you know, at the dinner table we had breakfast and dinner every day as a family. My mm. entire life growing up, and so there was intelligent conversation at the dinner table. Mm. She got Psychology Today magazine. My brother became a PhD in psychology, taught psychology, <laughs> college forever. So dinner conversation a lot was very right. shy, you know, yeah. the, the issue of psychology today. So I was mostly quiet and listen, but I had um, a good upbringing. Thankfully, I got good genes. Yeah. And I, I worked hard. You know, as a child, I was interested in sports and I played sports and I knew in Little League and when I was five how good I was and I saw I improved by the time I got to a, a, junior, a sophomore I was on the varsity team and mm. I could see that I improved and mm. and I so I had a sense that if you worked hard and get ahead our family were immigrants around the set, turn of the last century that they all came with nothing worked extremely hard owned companies, started companies, and Amazing. they succeeded. And so yeah. I had that, you know, the the the, the uh, family lore was my mother's father had started as a clerk at a hardware wholesaler and worked hard and ended up owning, buying the company on July, on Friday the 13th. So mm. that day was considered a, a good day in our family. <laughs> and he became very successful and ended up you know, helping a couple hundred members of the family financially when they didn't have money for pots and pans or mm. baseball gloves for their kids. Seven children were named after my grandpa, Harry. 
Wow. His mother, my father's father was a chief dress, dress designer in Toronto for the largest department store and had a dress design school and became an inventor and invented things like the six pack and the case and oh. cardboard boxes, women's boxes, which sold a hundred million boxes. Jeez. So I was, I knew that I had people in the family who started with nothing worked yes. hard and succeeded. And my parents nurtured that. Uh, never pushed us. They let us do whatever we chose to do. Mm. It was just expected that we would go to college and that would be successful. And my father then pushing me to do something good for society. Mm. Underpinnings kind of gave me the the belief in myself that, that I tried hard. When I was in college, for example, I took 10 gym classes, but I, I took more gym classes and I took classes in accounting work classes in, in economics as I was a jock in high school. Uh, and But I learned when I took a tennis class, for example, the teacher, it was 8 o'clock in the morning. It was across campus at Ohio State University, which is a long way away, a 20 mm -hmm. bike ride. It was a long way. And I, 8 a.m. class was not, I missed a lot of them. And the teacher said that if you, miss more than three classes, you fail. So at the last class, I missed many classes and I thought I was going to fail, which traumatized me. Right. And I, he said, we're playing doubles and I'm on the opposing team. And I realized at that moment that I better play well or else I'd fail. And so I dug deep and I played like I'd never played before in my life, before or since. <laughs> and it came to match point and it was tied. Oh my God. Getting ready to, and I could serve it like a rocket or hit it wherever I could, like a rocket, like I'd never done before. I was getting ready in the back corner, the back baseline corner. And I said to myself, if I get it in, we win and I'm going to fail. I better miss. So <laughs> I hit it. I just hit it just out. And we, I, we lost, but I did pass the class. Wow. <laughs> so I knew that I could succeed. If I tried hard, and that yes. I think with Melinda, I knew that if we tried hard and worked with companies, and I worked, I provided counseling to over 4,000 business people in my career for the city, mm. 150 a year. So I knew that companies were growing and needed space because yeah. they were best for looking for space. And yeah. I, I thought that that would be a wonderful space because they were building a building that was going to be a green building a lead certified building and people would want to be in there. Mm -hmm. Wow. What, so what a fantastic foundation for your life that your parents gave you. My goodness. And an extended family too. It sounds like. Now, uh, where did you grow up? Where, where was that? I grew up in West Hempstead, which is Long Island. Okay. Uh, and it was about 20 miles east of Manhattan on the South Shore. Uh, we grew up in a, what you would think of as a Levittown type of house, but it wasn't built by Levitt, it was built by gold. Yeah. And, but it was a former uh, potato farm years and years before. Yeah. It was track housing, kind of like yep. up South Burlington. Yep, yep. And it was on a hill, a small hill on Laurel Road and uh, it was a new house that was put up 1948. All these houses were built. My father just got out of the war, mm -hmm. uh, moved into a new house with everybody else who bought yep. new houses. So there were uh, every new young families, all little kids running up and down the street. And so we got to plant. I got a chance to play with the kids on the block growing up. Walter Neufeld lived across the street. Gail Johnson lived next to next to us, hmm. Myra and Janice, Goldstein lived next door, and, hmm. and you know, other kids we played with on the street, on the sidewalk, in the backyards, in the yep. woods behind the house. Yep. And uh, so I, I got a chance to grow up in a suburban neighborhood that was very safe, you know, yep. uh, and the kids could run around. We were expected to be home at dinner. You know, they didn't check in on us, and we would run around the neighborhood. When I was a little kid, I was I stayed close to the street, and then as 
I got older, I would explore the next block over and the next block over and the next block sure. over. You know, sure. Walton Hill was down the street, he was my age, and around the corner was Russell Porter. So, and up, up the block and around the corner was Michael Bird, and we would play, you know, street football, you know, with each of the end zones being the telephone poles and stick wow. ball and stupid wow. ball and, and, you know, yo yo. So when you were a little, Boy, what were your dreams of what you would be when you grow up? You know, I, I was, when I was, the first dream I had when I was five, my parents set up a savings account at Meadowbrook Savings Bank. They wanted to show us to how to save money and, earn, and, and put money away. So yeah. uh, we would go, I would save my allowance and uh, we would go to the bank and uh, we would put in the bank, and I, the teller was there, and I said to myself, God, I want to get it, be a banker. That's where all the money is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Other than the money went to this place. What do you know? It's like, <laughs> you know, Irma Brombeck had this story. You know, her father would go to work. She knew it worked. Then she, so she threw the doll under the bed because that was work to her. You know, she didn't, she didn't know the, didn't know what that meant. So I thought the money was there. And then probably I watched television as a kid uh, and I read I read books about archaeology. I was interested mm -hmm. in archaeologists. Just, that would interest me. And I saw dancers and dancers on TV and I, I saw myself as a dancer. And mm -hmm. those were kind of the three things mm -hmm. that, as a child. But I really didn't have dreams other than the fact that I thought I would own a company because my extended family, my uncle had a furniture right. factory and retail stores. My aunt and uncle had a travel agency in Manhattan. Yep. And, uh, my father had a television repair and building business in the basement when I was young. And then the extended family all had companies. So I just yep. assumed uh, that I would own a company. And my parents, my mother's cousin, Ernie Dicker, uh, said to me, you know, study accounting so you can start a company. So, so my dream was yeah. to own a company and uh, being at my self-employed and have yeah. employees. Like that yep. was my dream. Yep. Any kind of company in particular? <clears throat> uh, after uh, I started working, for the Champlain Valley Work and Training Program in the city, I, I started thinking about that. When I was young, no, I didn't, no, I just, mm -hmm. I would, I yep. would explore. I, I worked for my uncle's company as an installation person for putting furniture in people's houses. I worked and I learned, uh, you know, about interacting with customers. I worked for my aunt, we had a travel agency. I'd take the train and the Long Island Railroad, standing <laughs> like a sardine on the train. As I was like, I don't want to do this again. And so I learned customer service. I learned, you know, accounts receivable, payable. And I had a degree in accounting. And uh, the, my, between my junior and senior year, I worked for my mother's childhood friend, Bernie Evans, at a company called Margolin Wine and, and Evans in, in uh, Long Island. Mm -hmm. And I worked in an accounting firm where I, my, I had a summer, I had a job to digitize all their records. So I, I ended up reading all their files while I was digitizing it. Wow. And I saw what it was like to work for an accounting firm. And at that time, to be a CPA, you had to apprentice an accounting firm. And there's no way I wanted to work for an accounting firm. Mm -hmm. so I, I decided that I would probably just own my own company. And, and by the time I got to working, I started, I wrote a couple of business plans. Uh, one was for the nursing homes, because that was in our family. And so, yeah. and the other was to start a business that was, that would service the elderly, a conglomerate. They would have from TV, mm. radio stations that service the elderly to products and services. So I started mm. dreaming up products and services that the elderly could have and so you would actually have this company that would service and support the elderly of our mm -hmm. so by the time we got to this age the demographics showed boom 
with all need all these services and right be in places a multitude of companies that I was going to create. Mm, mm, mm. But I realized at that moment that I liked what I was doing, um, helping businesses succeed, and yeah. I got a chance to live vicariously through their successes. Yeah, that's and that's exactly right. You, you know, you're in some ways you're a public entrepreneur, Bruce. Um, and you have facilitated all these businesses uh, amazingly, actually amazingly. So, um, you know, Marion Wright Edelman talks about the lanterns in her life, the people that in her life um, helped mentor her to become the woman that she became. Who are some of your lanterns? My Aunt Dora Maxwell, my mother's aunt, um, she was, she kept her maiden name at that time hmm. in the 30s. Yeah. It was unheard of. And right. she was working uh, in an industry that was all male. She was interested in the cons the principles of cooperatives. Mm -hmm. And she, the idea of credit unions was being formed in this country. So she worked with uh, Mr. Bergeron and six other men and uh, was funded by Edward Filene from Filene's basement. Wow, yeah. And they established the credit union industry in this country. Uh, and so she spent her career 22 years crisscrossing the United States and first setting up hundreds of credit unions in several months. My goodness. And, uh, and then helping to establish the Credit Union National Association, CUNA, in Wisconsin. And she'd commute to Wisconsin from New York and she became head, of, became head of education for the national organization. Hmm. And uh, she uh, sat me down at a family dinner. Our family would get together as the holidays, year after year, as an extended family. And I was graduating college, high school, going to college. And she was one of the uh, people uh, with a conscience. And in fact, they named an award after her, the Dora Maxwell Award for Social Responsibility. So wow. she had friends that were activists in, uh, in the socialist movement. Uh, Helen and Scott Nearing, friend. Yeah. yeah. And oh. uh, uh, she knew Amin Hennessy and uh, the founder of the Catholic Worker Movement. And uh, so she was interested in the nuclear freeze movement. And so she, she uh, provided land and she would do voter registration to get people involved politically. And she provided land for these two high rise buildings in, in Brooklyn Heights that was uh, land trust housing uh, in around 1960. And all of her colleagues that are interested in social causes moved into these like 40 story, 40 story towers. Hmm. And uh, she uh, was uh, very active in the social responsibility movement before there was one. When they would go out, when they were traveling, these six other men and her, they would go out to eat. And she said, if you can afford to eat out and you can afford to donate the same amount of money to charity. Hmm. And so she would push these people for years to do that. That's why they named the Social Responsibility Award after her, because she lived her values. So she sat me down at dinner, just a half hour conversation, and said, you know, these are things that are important to her, and I should, I was a jock in high school, and she opened my eyes, because well, the yeah. war in Vietnam was happening, and she basically explained her perspective on life, and she did that over time. So she was one person, yeah. my mother's, and my mother's sister's mother-in-law was one of the early day traders in the stock market. Hmm. And she escaped <clears throat> Nazi Germany, uh, smuggled another couple out and her family out of the, got stuck in Casablanca, you know, and they're on this boat and they got put in prison. And, uh, and she, you know, the, the family that she was with, that she paid to get passage, was very sick, the man was very sick in the hospital. And she had all these uh, 
gems that she hid, that she took with her, and she yeah. bribed uh, the family, they bribed the people at the prison to let, not the prison, but at the hospital, to let the family and her leave Casablanca after being waylaid there for several months, and they came to this country. So she mm. became a day trader in the stock market. So she was, you know, a, a strong woman that helped many people in our family and other family and other family live because of her dedication. So she was another Manya Adler was her name. Hmm. They had a company of they made pianos. Adler pianos got burned down by the Nazis. <clears throat> wow. Um, and so she was another lantern. My my son, when hmm. I was working, uh, I wanted to be a better person uh, when he came along and in 1998, and I was working for the city, and I want the city to do be better. I wanted to have programs and policies that supported young people, mm. and I wanted to be a better person. So he uh, uh, motivated me. I was working hard to do better and be a better person. Uh, my parents were lights in my way, for sure. Yeah. I, yeah. I, uh, I think of them often as what the, what would they do? And yeah. My father was a good man. He was an altruist. He believed in this country. Mm. He, uh, he was getting an international world award in Cal in California for quality control. He started a school for quality engineering in Long Island, New York City, and New Jersey. Mm. The professional society. He had seven hundred professional engineers in the school. My mother was the registrar of the school part-time. My father ran the school and taught a course in quality engineering. And he was going out to receive this award in California. And I was going to go and watch him. And it turns out he got a heart attack. And he had me give his speech in front of oh 5,000 people. <laughs> it was all How old? How old were you? That was 1990, so 40. Yeah, okay. Um, so I met all these people that my father influenced who came wow. up after I gave his speech. And, you know, the person who wrote the book for quality engineering that's used in colleges everywhere came up to me and said, your, your father got me to, be, to do this work and made me, you know, stick with it. And now this book's used all over the world and, you know, and other people came up to me. Many people came up and said my father had helped them. And, and I, my father never, ever, ever talked about work during his life. It was all about family. Wow, interesting. He you know, things uh, from, other, from other people's eyes yeah. Yeah. into me about, about my father and the influence that he had. And I mean, he had, a, a, during the war, he was as at the signal corps and they sent him to Michigan to inspect factory where they made Jeeps. Hmm. And uh, they were the noise suppression system didn't work. And so he stopped the factory production line. And the head of the factory was freaked out by it. But my father didn't want American soldiers being killed by the Nazis because they could hear the Jeeps coming. Yeah. And so he was not uh viewed favorably by the head of this company because he was stock production. Um, and he had been a teletype operator before the war and was in the secretary to the union uh, of the teletype operators. So the, when he was in the Signal Corps, one of these guys there wanted a promotion, and my father was getting promoted very quickly, hiring mm -hmm. his friends, getting, he was just, the organization was growing tremendously, and he was very successful. Well, somebody wanted a promotion, and uh, made an assertion my father was a communist sympathizer. And all of a sudden, his promotion stopped. He didn't know what was going on. And after the war, he taught at a college, communications, which he had been teaching in the Signal Corps. And that came up then. The whole McCarthy area happened, and he lost his job. Because wow. Some guy who wanted to get ahead, calling my father a communist sympathizer. Wow. And uh, he had three young kids and no job. And he started a uh, 
business in the basement, making fixing televisions, uh, building televisions. In fact, we had the first television on our street. And he would go door to door, not door to door, but he would make service calls to people's homes. And I was yeah. three, four, and five. I'd be his assistant carrying all his tools and watched him interact with people. And, you know, I'd charge him a nickel for each call, and then I'd charge him a dime. <laughs> and, and, uh, the joke in the family was when I charged, I raised my rates to a quarter when I was five. I put him out of business. <laughs> I had a job at that point uh, as an engineer, and uh, the the only time he talked about his job at the dinner table was when he got top secret clearance because he worked in a lot of defense companies. Which mm. was, this whole stain <clears throat> of atheism was past him, and he was a. He wrote, you know, the president ideas and how to build the economy. And he was he was passionate about building America and as being the best, best place in the world to be. And he was training engineers how to improve systems. In fact, he created a curriculum on the healthcare industry on how to improve quality of hospitals. Oh and my goodness. So he started certificate programs, college degree programs. And uh, eventually, when he after he died, actually they named the school after my parents. Was, wow, wow. So your father was able to your father was able to pivot quite quickly when faced with a terrible situation during the McCarthy era. Um, how how have you done with that when you've reached uh, difficult moments in your life and, and gotten through those? How do, how have you done that? Um, in my family growing up, laughter was really important. Mm. Um, my father was funny, my brother was funny, my uncle was funny, my great uncle was funny, my aunt was funny. And <laughs> I would be this just sitting there laughing at the dinner table, you know, at, at, at the, the big family gatherings, my they, people cracking jokes left and right. And it was just so I learned that laughter is good medicine, yeah. And it also it physically, it actually helps you deal with stress. That's right. So I've used humor as a way to, to deal with stress, uh, to laugh at myself, not take myself too seriously. Yeah. Work hard, but that's a way that I've been able to deal with it is yeah. use humor and know that uh, trust in people around you. Yeah. Uh, and use the system, but also verify. Yeah. And, you know, use your own knowledge and your extended network to verify and make sure that where the direction you're heading is appropriate and trust mm -hmm. people. I, one of the things I did growing up was hitchhike a lot. Hmm. And I hitchhiked across the country after college. Hmm. I Florida. I used to hitchhike to college from New York to Ohio. I would take trips just to have fun. And I learned when you stick your head in the window to say where you're going, how to size people up quickly. Yeah. Because, you know, occasionally I had a bad ride, right. but I learned how to communicate to people and how to quickly size them up, which became very handy when I was counting. Mm -hmm. Thousands, four thousand people over my career. I had to size people up. Had to talk with them. I was shy as a kid growing up, uh, but you had to learn how to put yourself out there. And the joke in the family was, we had a house. My great aunt Dora, who had, they had built a house in Pauling, New York, over five years, a stone house and cliff. It was a beautiful place. We used to go there on vacation, mm -hmm. and I would hitchhike to there. And the joke in the family is, would Bruce be able to convince the guy or the guy or the girl to drive him down this very windy road in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> and invariably, I'd be able to, you know, get to know people, and I'd always get a ride right to the house. You know, I, <laughs> and, you know, when I'd be hitchhiking places, I wouldn't this would bring a map. I would just trust my sense that I would get there. Hmm. And I had a roommate in college who lived in Connecticut. Danbury, Connecticut, lived in a suburban neighborhood like I did growing up. And I just figured I'd find it. Just trust my intuition, and I found it. 
<laughs> uh, no, just trust your gut. And trust your gut. Yep. Verify. Yep. Also, sometimes you're wrong. And right. Learn from that. Um, yep. But it's mostly trust in myself. Mm. Uh, and, you know, you treat people with respect and dignity. They usually treat you well. Yep. And I just, it's done you well. And I have witness to that many times in your life, Bruce. So we've talked about work. We've talked about your family. What are some of the things you like to do for yourself, for fun, besides laugh? <laughs> <laughs> well, reality is I do a lot of different things. Uh, but my career, I ended up, I worked 24 seven. You know, the last 20 years of my life, I was working day and night, seven days a week. Yeah. So a lot of the things that I used to do, I just gave up because I, I poured myself into my career and my family. But things that I did do, and I still do, is I have a nice, beautiful garden. Mm -hmm. uh, and that um, gives me joy to see people stop. I, spray a lot, I plant a lot of bulbs in the spring in the front. I live on a... Mm -hmm. Uh, in the South End by Callahan Park, and people stop, take pictures of the flowers. I like giving flowers to my garden to my friends. Mm. Uh, I've mountain biked a lot in the past uh, in Stowe, and I love doing that. And I have a bike. I like getting on the bike path. I like going through the woods, walking through the woods. I find that to be healing yeah. in nature. Uh, yeah. I like visiting with my friends, and um, I'm a deadhead. So I like uh, going to concerts, mm -hmm. uh, and I have a broad network of friends across the country that I stay in touch with uh, and visit, who visit me. Yeah. Uh, so I like socializing. Uh, I like uh, our community, the city is vibrant, it really is. So I like going to some of the places that I help support uh, uh, go to the waterfront, you know, and see that. And go out to some of the restaurants, some of the people that I know I help. Yep. I, I've been able to, uh, I like writing. Mm. I've been, since I stopped working for the city in 2012, I've off, co authored three books. I have a book coming out next week, actually, on community owned enterprises around the, around the world. Wow. And so, um, I like helping people. So I've been continued to do that in my privately helping uh, some of the local business people still call on me. I enjoy that. And I've been doing the writing process and following up with some of the businesses that I've helped and still mm -hmm. met leaders. And that gives me joy. Uh, so I like staying engaged, uh, with the business community that I've worked with over the, over the years. Yeah. So, uh, I like, you know, some of the people that I got to know at work, I was too busy to become friendly with, but mm -hmm. now I'm more friendly with people like Fred Schmidt, who ran the center for rural studies at the university of Vermont. Uh, people like, uh, Peter Clavell was my boss. Mm. Uh, Will Rapp from Gardner Supply, Bill Mayers, who helped me start the, South End Arts and Business Association, who's an author, former journalist, and right. teacher. Uh, so I spend time with friends like you and Mark Fanari, go for walks, yep. um, and getting exercise. You know, I'm still a jock at heart. So I, I am, you know, I was a natural athlete growing up. So I, I like, if I can continue to do sports, I, I, I try to do it as much as I can. That's great. So I look, looking behind you, I see a number of um, awards up on your wall there. Tell, tell, tell us about some of those. Where did you get them from? Well, one of them is uh, well, two awards, actually. Um, one is from, well, two of them are from the Vermont Energy Investment Corporation. I helped uh, Blair Hamilton and Beth Sachs they came to the office, Bernie was mayor, they had this idea for an organization. And I said to myself, now here's some smart people, I'm gonna work with them. 
So every Tuesday afternoon, I used to go to the house and I'll write a business plan for Vermont Energy Investment Corporation. Hmm. An idea on how to raise the money to create the organization and became president of the board, I was on the board for 12 years. So I got an award. Let me get it, actually. I'll come right back. Yep. I got an award from the EIC, <laughs> shredded money in a, in a light bulb. Oh, my goodness. And uh, so that's an award. Thanks from the bottom of your heart award to help them. And they grew to over 200 people. So that was great. Another award that I got is an old light bulb from a, from a, yeah, it's made out of cement. And wow. it is South End Arts and Business Association Innovation Award 2010. So I helped create the South End Arts and Business Association. Mm -hmm. uh, I have an award from the Vermont Employee Ownership Center. Uh, Don Jamison came to the city and my idea to create an organization and we've been promoting employee ownership. So I spent seven years on their board, helped conceive wow. of that organization. And um, I got um, proclamations from the city mm -hmm. government. Um, one was for a small business administration award for small business advocate and financial services, uh, which Governor Howard Dean gave me. And so one of the proclamation of the city recognizing the achievements that I have. I have a uh, you know, recognition from Senator Jeffords, uh, mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders and Pat Leahy, Senator Leahy. Uh, others um, one is a, in a, a letter that went to the city council from Tom O'Brien, who recently passed away, unfortunately. He was president of the South End Arts and Business Association, which basically says something to the effect that Bruce just helped stoke the fires on Pine Street and the places you know, booming, and we just thought I'd let you know, which was <laughs> really nice because that is I, I put a lot of effort into revitalizing the Pine Street Corridor, and it's a national, international model. People yeah. all over the world to look at what we've accomplished in Burlington. I wrote a yeah. book called The uh, Sustainable Communities Creating a Durable Local Economy. Mm. Uh, I've been interviewed on you know, on South Korean television, uh, Slovakia, you know, the BBC, uh, innumerable yeah. Yeah. Na national media about what we accomplished. Uh, and my co-author, uh, Rhonda Phillips, has co-authored dozens of books. And I recently spent a little time with her uh, she's the dean at Purdue University, hmm. uh, at the Honors College, and I was. She was in Bennington, and um, we went out to lunch. And I don't really know her that well. I've co-authored three books with her. I just did work with her, and she said when she went to graduate school in the '80s, she studied community economic development as a PhD, and she learned what we were doing at my office and what I was doing. I said, "You got to be kidding." Hmm. So what we've done is uh, been replicated around the world. People showed up from Tasmania at City Hall from Australia. They said they read this book, they wanna learn what we did. And they came back the next year and mm -hmm. spent a couple a week or two training them. Yeah. What we so what we've done is, it, it's Amazing. not rocket science. It's basically right. ask people what they want and help them get it. You know, it's unlocked the capacity within the community. Yeah and just be a facilitator and nurture that. That's fantastic. You know, I think today many people who benefit from the South End uh, businesses and arts culture there uh, don't appreciate what it was 30 years ago um, to where it's become today. Uh, good, good for you, Bruce.
is there anything in your career or life that you still want to do that you haven't done yet? You know, produce a movie, act in a, you know. I was asked to make a movie actually recently and I turned it down. <laughs> About the work that I had done actually. Ah, it doesn't surprise me. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I set goals for myself. Uh, I set a 20 year plan uh, when I was 30 and I met it in 10. Hmm. Uh, I, my goals at this point are to enjoy myself enjoy my life, uh, enjoy my friends, enjoy the community, uh, continue to be an active member of our community, stretch yep. my mind, yep. uh, continue to learn, uh, and educate myself, challenge myself, uh, and become healthier as I age. Um, I want to continue to focus on my health and my well-being and learn about that and help my friends and family. To yep. do my, I have extended family. I want to continue to see them. I'm very close with my brother, Mark, and my sister, Mary. Great. I want to continue to spend time with them, which I did over the July 4th holidays for five days. We just hung out together. That's wonderful. And, uh, spent time with my family. So yep. career-wise, you know, I've, I've, I don't want to start a company at this point, even though I have a, a business that I'm finally operating, which is providing support to the business community at large and other communities across the country. I still mm -hmm. do advising them. Yep. Uh, and I have a book coming out next week, so I'll be. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, what's the title of your book? Well, it's the title is basically it's this is not the exact title, but it's community owned enterprises around the world. And, it's that's basically what it's about. If I was to name it, that's what I would call it. Okay. Uh, but there's authors from all over the world talking about the pandemic and what does it mean to the community and the business community and what's being done contemporaneously right now all over the world to rebuild society and communities and economies based on uh, what's happening, which is businesses are being supported by their communities in a big way. Right. In a hard time, hundreds of thousands of companies have gone out of business in this country. Right. It's a pandemic. And communities realize how important it is to have businesses there to provide a services and products, but also a, a place for commerce and also culture and gathering. And a lot of people invest now in companies and they mm -hmm. And so communities, not everybody succeeds in that. Like in Underhill, there was a, a corner store in, in a country store that went out of business. Community came together to try to make it resurrected, but it didn't work. So yeah. what learn from where it's working? Yeah. All right. Well, in closing, Bruce, is any words of wisdom you'd like to share with the audience about how to maneuver through their life? Sure. I guess I used to have a, a couple of signs on my wall at the office. Mm -hmm. One of them said, uh, one way to predict the future is to invent it. Mm, I like that. Figure out what you want to do and make it happen. Yep. The other one was absent health. Nothing else matters. Mm. Um, so stay focused on a balanced life. Yep. Uh, laugh a lot. Yeah. <laughs> medicine. Trust your gut. Mm. Uh, listen to yourself. Mm. Sometimes you're wrong. Learn from yeah. it. Yes. Mm. Lighten up. You know, our, our country is divided fairly hard right now. And I think people um, they should work hard, but have a good time. And there's usually solutions to problems. Collaborate. Collaborate with people that you don't think you should. Talk mm. to people and listen to them, especially if you don't agree with them. Mm. Friendly with them. 
uh, get to know them, have them get to know you, yeah. and unlock capacity within yourself, within your community, within your family. Um, that was one of the most rewarding parts of my job. Mm. Stick with your better angels. Mm. You know, listen to your inner self and you can't go wrong. Um, the one person that I turned to was Martin Luther King. Mm. He had, I have a dream speech. and I used to have a file in my office. I still have that file. And I, when I would be questioning myself, I'd read that speech to, to uh, inspire myself. Um, keep putting yourself out there. It's amazing what you can accomplish, especially when you say it could never happen. You know, uh, Ben and Jerry's got this award for small business people of the year from Vermont and then the whole country. Yeah. Uh, and one thing that Ben Cohen said was there's a, there's a rudder on an ocean liner and there's a little teeny rudder, it feels like a trip wheel or something like that. Mm. Cause they're like this little trip wheel that moves before the rudder moves. Mm. And eventually the ocean liner moves. So mm. I don't think it'll ever happen it might happen. You know, one thing I, Margaret Mead said, I think that, you know, one person could change the world. It affects probably the only thing it ever did. So yeah. trust in yourself that you can actually make a difference and, and you probably will. Uh, and I think that find joy and see where it leads you. Uh, smile. You know, smiles can turn a bad situation into a good thing. Mm -hmm. so I, to me, it's, you know, be yourself. Don't try to be somebody you're not. And be true to yourself. Listen to yourself. And that's what I try to do. And, and also listen to other people. And, you know, one of the things I did was I helped create something called the Vermont Technology Alliance in the Vermont Bioscience Alliance and Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility as organizations. And they normally see themselves as competitors, but they, one of the things I try to get them to do is to see that they can work collaboratively together and find their common problems and work on that. And then they can work together to, to solve those. And by doing that, they can be successful themselves. And that seemed to resonate with those companies and they, mm -hmm tech industry in this state has gone tre grown tremendously because they collaborated when they normally see themselves as competition. Right. See, and I learned that, you know, being a quarterback in high school, when 10 eyes are looking at you, 10 sets of eyes are looking at you and they're all looking to be successful. And you don't, you want to be successful because so you don't want to be tackled, you know, right. but you also want to succeed and you don't want to let people down. And so when under pressure, and everybody's looking at you, you can succeed, you know, and trust within yourself. And, you know, our team wasn't that great, but what I learned that you can be successful. You know, I, I went to Ohio State. I didn't make their teams. I didn't try to be on their teams, but I ended up playing pickup games with the second and string football team. Mm -hmm. you know? And when you play with people better than yourself, it helps better. You know, excel. Yeah. And I, yeah. I ended up playing, and I didn't remember this. I, I found the old letters that I wrote to my parents, and I read them recently. And one letter was I wrote to my parents, and it said, We played, I was playing a pickup game against the second string quarterback at Ohio State. And I threw five touchdowns, and he threw four, and we won. <laughs> <laughs> I had no recollection of it. But what it was, I had this guy who was one of their ends on the football team, and he was so fast. And I said, what's the play? He says, throw it as far as you can, and I'll catch it. <laughs> That's what he did. <laughs> I just threw it four yards, and he it was like a lightning bolt. And, you know, wow. so you can play up if you play with people better than yourself. Yes, you know? yes. Learn from other people, and trust yourself yes. pretty well in the long run. Uh, your community will do wrong if you do well as well. So I think that, you know, I think my party knowledge is that trust in yourself, trust in others, put yourself out there, work hard, have a good time, you know, and have fun. And if you have fun, 
you relax. So when you relax, you seem to actually improve. Yep. And the last thing I'll say, Good. I played softball with a group of folks on Friday nights called the Smallheads. People like Michael Monty and Barn Hill and Tony Sini, yep. Libby Harden, and a whole group of local Burlington people. Mostly, they were artists. They were art departments at, a hot, at UVM, mm -hmm. Middlebury, and St. Mike's. And we would play, and it was a drinking league, you know? We didn't, we barely kept score. And, and we, you know, we had like 15 people out in the field. And if somebody couldn't hit, we'd pitch the ball till they could hit the ball, you know, and they're like 20, 30 pitches. But after yep. four or five years, you know, Aaron can hit the ball, you know, and make it. <laughs> she'd always make the first base anyway. So we, she would hit it. She would play until she'd hit it. And if they, and the ball hit it, you would try to catch it, but you would actually miss it on purpose. But you want to make it look like you're going to catch it. Right. They would feel good about themselves so they get on base and get. Right. And what happened was, is that we ended up, everyone did that. They would let everybody else on base. At the end of the game, it was tie score and everybody won. We didn't, you know, that was how it ended. But yeah. what we learned was that if you relax, you enjoy yourself, and you don't try, you make these incredible catches. You know, like you're trying to try, you run out to the field, you know you're going to miss it. All of a sudden, you catch it. And you say, how the heck? <laughs> you know? But we learned that if you, you know, you can keep score, but it really doesn't matter. Treat, relax, and enjoy yourself. And when you do that, you excel. And our team used to beat all the teams in town. We were not that great to begin with, but we just had fun, but also fun. relaxed. When your, when your muscles relax, it's like if you sink when you swim, the best way to actually not sink is to relax and your muscles actually get oxygen. Exactly. exactly. So float as much as you possibly can. So float. All right. Sage wisdom, Bruce. Thank you so much for the interview and the time together. And on behalf of everyone who lives in Burlington, thank you for all you've given to the city. Thank we're better, you. We're better for it. It's been a pleasure to get to know you over time. And uh, I respect everything you did as a city council in your career what you've done for the city of Burlington, what you're doing now, what you've done for the Cemetery Association. <laughs> <From on. laughs> Let people know that their cemetery is important. I, I appreciate what you're doing. And, I, and thank you for the opportunity to, to talk with you as well. And, and My pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you.